Yes, good evening everyone. It's Thursday night, it's 8 p.m. and you're welcome to the Master Tradition on Facebook Live. I'm your co-host Tracy and together with Joe we'll be with you for the next hour. Tonight we're joined by Robert de Koning, wine expert from Wine Week a Week to speak about wine bubbles and possibly what to drink for Valentine's Day. Yay! Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Maastricht edition. Here we are again, and we're starting on time, Tracy. Um, yes, we are indeed. So, <laughs> hey. no, no gremlins in Facebook this evening. Hurrah, hurrah! And okay. yes, it's our episode just before Valentine's. Oh my mm. goodness! We're supposed to be getting all romantic this evening. Are you in a romantic mood, Tracy? Not right at this moment, Joe. No. <laughs> Valentine's Day is several days away just yet, isn't it? It's, so it's, we it's, have some time. It's, it's, I find it difficult to get uh, excited about uh, uh, Valentine's Day. I haven't got excited about Valentine's Day for a few years, but that's probably because I've been married for so long. But, uh, but anyway, the, this I think uh, having been shut up for the last uh, couple of years, we've got to try and uh, work up some momentum for these kind of things, haven't we? But uh, it's very difficult, isn't it? Well, I suppose it is and it isn't. It's uh, it's falling on a Monday night, so people who are perhaps going to celebrate, it's not the greatest night of the week to go mm. out. Everything is tends to be quieter. The weather hasn't been terribly romantic. It would really encourage you to go outdoors, I suppose, oh, would it? So, but yeah, but to each his own. I'm sure the, the hopeless romantics out there will be able to uh, to come up with a good plan to enjoy uh day of love or whatever uh, <laughs> they want to uh... well at least all the restaurants are open now so uh, if anybody wants to go out celebrating this weekend there's probably uh, a few restaurants in the area that are doing these little romantic valentine's day packages i suspect there are and i mean restaurants are open at least till 10 p.m so people can get out and, yes. and do something can't they so yeah not all is lost <laughs> yes absolutely and how's your week been trace anything exciting going on in maastricht city <laughs> center well, no, not not particularly. Just the uh, the same old, same old, really. Uh, so nothing too exciting to report from this side. Well, I've been uh, out and about to a couple of places, and I have noticed that uh, there is certainly some uh, uh, carnival yeah. buzz in the air. Where I've seen some of the shops stocking up and putting all their carnival bits and bobs out in the shops, and some mm. of the fancy dress uh, costumes have been appearing in in, in various shops. Indeed, I repeat, nothing terribly exciting to report on this side. <laughs> yeah, well, for those who, uh, who joined us last week, uh, we did have uh, the, the lovely uh, Lucy and Katrina from uh, Meet Maastricht uh, on the show, and they were giving us a rundown about Carnival. We still don't know for sure if it's definitely going to be... Ha- well, we know something's going to be happening, don't we? But we don't know to what extent. Yeah, I believe the, the current sort of thought is that people might still dress up and come and kind of merge in the city places but I believe the idea of people going indoors and cafes and you know carnival of of old probably isn't going to go ahead but again who knows (laughs) things change quite quickly so you never know no absolutely Mika's in the house good evening Mika lovely to have you with us are you doing anything for uh, Valentine's? We would like to know. Or are you going to be getting all dressed up for Carnival? We want to hear from everybody out there. Let us know about your uh, lovely plans for Valentine's. Or maybe you have some disasters for Valentine's. Speaking of which, Tracy, I've got a few mm-hmm. here for you. This, oh, God. this is probably going to make you cringe. So we got uh, uh, Leo, um, Leona here. She said, we went out for dinner. Um, he leaned in to kiss me. And his hair got caught in the candle. He didn't realise and proceeded to spread the fire to my very nice dress and then blamed it on me and I never saw him again. God, that's that's quite bizarre. (laughs) That's horrendous, isn't it? Um, um, Matt here says, uh, um, the guy I've been seeing gave me black and dead roses, saying that's how we saw our relationship. Did there, yeah, well, I, I guess that was a quick Valentine's dinner. Mm. Oh, that's just awful. Um, we've got uh, Ella here. She says, um, my then boyfriend surprised me with a gift and it ended up being a shirt of mine that I'd left at his place. Oh, God, busted. 
Oh, these are horrendous. This, mm. this is, uh, yeah, this is not the idea of the, of the perfect Valentine. I'm just going to uh, uh, do one more. Um, on, oh, this is a bit creepy. On the way to the restaurant, he was telling me how he'd cracked his phone screen. And when I glanced at his phone, I realised that the background was a picture of me. Oh. We've been seeing each other for a week. Ooh, wow. <laughs> he was keen then. <laughs> he, was, he was definitely keen, mm. definitely. But, of course, some of you out there may not. Uh, be going out for Valentine's Day. Some of you, of course, um, may be single and you don't celebrate Valentine's Day at all and you would rather stay at home with a good book. Indeed. And actually those of us, some couples also don't do Valentine's Day. You know, they shy away from that uh, kind of um, occasion where it's all just about the money and the cards and Hallmark. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, so uh, there you go. But anyway, back to the book. Sorry. Yeah, well, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Because, you know, you, you, you look at the shops and it's just full of all this commercial stuff that we're, we're supposed to be buying. And mm -hmm. and uh, you get forced into uh, uh, celebrating something that may be, you know, you're romantic throughout the year. You don't need to be buying it. But then, I don't know, it makes you feel a bit guilty if you don't, you know, there's sometimes there's expectations and, yeah, and yeah. we'll say, no, no, you don't have to get me anything. And then if you don't get something, then oh, yeah, I'm a little bit disappointed. Oh, it's a minefield. Yeah, gosh, yeah. I think we get, let's get back to the book. It's less, uh, less complicated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so book of the week this week that comes from the uh, um, English bookstore in Maastricht. Um, we have got, recommended by the lovely Kirsty. A uh, message in a bottle by Nicholas Sparks. Um, mm. Apparently, this is uh, ideal for Valentine's. It's time for a star-crossed love story, and who better than Nicholas Sparks, the New York Times best-selling author, famous for his stories of love, romance, misconnections, usually by a quaint seaside town. Oh, I don't okay. know Nicholas Sparks. Do you, Trace? I've heard of. Him. Didn't he also write The Horse Whisperer? Isn't that the same chap? Oh, I don't know, actually. I'm not sure. I don't know. No, but he, he's not one that graces my bookcase. I have to okay. Um, but it says here he's, he's best well known for The Notebook and A Walk to Remember. Ah, The Notebook. That's the one I was thinking of, not The Horse Whisperer. Fair enough. They've both been turned into <laughs> the films, notebook. though, haven't they? The Notebook, yeah, indeed. Actually, I've seen The Notebook. Um, the other I have not seen nor read. Uh, apparently, this one has also been turned into a movie. It's got uh, Kevin Costner and Paul Newman. Oh, okay. Fair not, enough. Yeah. But anyway, it's set in a small coastal town in North Carolina. Uh, Teresa finds the uh, titular message in a bottle, and she is a very successful columnist on vacation with her son. Um, ah. She's uh, going through a, a, her divorce, which might be why the message inside the bottle moves her so much. It is a letter to a lost love, and the pain and mystery of it all call to her to try and find the writer, a man named Garrett. She oh. looks for clues in the small sunlit town and in other mysterious letters helped by her best friend. It is a beautiful story about love, of course, but also about grief, choices and second chances. It is about relationships ending and the frailty of love, but also its strength and the hope of new love with a sprinkling of suspense, mm. a light mystery to follow. So apparently this is a great read for those who want to indulge in the spirit of Valentine's this February. Ah, OK. It's, for me, it's, I'm sure it's great. I'm sure it's a, a very, very good read. And obviously, yeah, get down to the English bookstore if that's your kind of thing. Personally, not my kind of thing. But uh, although mm. I probably would watch the films, I do like Kevin Costner. Well, there you go. There's logic there, isn't there? So, uh, and Paul Newman. <laughs> yeah, well, you can't go wrong. Both of them in the same film. So that's going to yeah. work out well. Yeah. yeah. Okay, very good. Is Paul Newman still with us? He is, isn't he? I think so. Isn't he the guy who makes the jars of tomato sauce or something now? He does like, I think it's like barbecue sauces and stuff, isn't oh, it? Oh, right. Well, I think he's still around, isn't he? I don't know. I think so. Paul, I don't know. Paul, if you're watching, let us know. <laughs> Are you with us? <laughs> if you're not, maybe you can contact us some other way. Oh, it's terrible, isn't it? I've kind of got to the stage where I just can't remember who's alive or dead anymore. <laughs> 
Oh God, yeah, I don't know. I'll have to Google it later. I honestly don't know, but I, I, I think he is still going strong. Oh, I've just been told. Oh, there you go. I've just been told by Adam. Paul Newman passed away in two thousand and eight. Oh, right. Not going strong at all then. OK. <laughs> but his barbecue sauces live on. That's that's maybe where we're getting confused. OK, well, RIP Paul Newman then. Oh, hmm. my goodness. That's terrible. <laughs> maybe he can contact us beyond the grave. <laughs> oh, I don't think I've ever had any of his sauces either, have you? Um, no, are they available in Europe? I think, are, are they only in the US? No I'm, not sh I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But then again, as a, a non-meat eater, I wouldn't really have much call for a barbecue sauce. Do you not stick your veggies on a barbecue? Yes, but I wouldn't put barbecue sauce on them. No? So I wouldn't. No, no, no. So I wouldn't get the... But I don't know if you can buy the sauces in Europe. I thought it was in US. I have no, I, well, I've, never, I've never tried them. I know he's famous for them, but I've never tried them. I've got no idea. Oh, well. Okay. Shout, <laughs> shout out to everybody. Have you tried the Paul Newman sauces? There you go. That's the question of the evening. What are the Paul Newman sauces like? Maybe they're not just, I'm saying barbecue, but maybe you, you use them for other things as well. I don't know. I know nothing about Paul Newman sauces. Maybe people can enlighten us. Hurrah. <laughs> let's let's wait for the info to, to roll in. <laughs> it doesn't get right. any more excited than that. I know. God. Well, it will get a little bit more excited later because, uh, as uh, Tracy mentioned at the top of the hour, we've got Robert de Koning from Wine. Yes. He's going to be coming in. He's our resident wine guru, and he's going to be talking about uh, what we should be drinking, not just on Valentine's Day, but uh, we're coming into... We are coming into spring, believe it or not, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, our tastes change, don't they, as, uh, well, as tastes change? They do, they can, although some of us do just drink red wine all year round, but uh, but yes, in, <laughs> in other senses. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's a little bit too soon to start thinking about Easter time, but I'm sure Robert will be back on again then to give some advice, and for now, let's see what he's got to share with us this evening. So. Yes, I did notice some crocuses coming up in the garden this week. Ah, I see. Nice, That's a good nice. sign. Definitely. Yeah, indeed. And um, yesterday yeah. when we had some really nice weather, it was uh, that uh, with the sun going down, it was way past six actually, and it was still uh, mm -hmm. quite light, which is oh, yes, it's coming. That is nice to see. Let's hope we don't peak too soon though, because for the coming few nights, it's supposed to dip below zero at night time. So uh, let's hope the poor crocuses, croci, uh, don't uh, don't peak too soon. It's uh, always a big worry for gardeners this time of year when it, when it comes to uh, putting out your summer bulbs, when to put them out and your seedlings for vegetables and uh, such like, when do you put them out? When is yeah. the last frost? Yeah, we've, we've been known to have a, 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 a late frost in, in April before, you know, yeah. May. So uh, it's, it's always a worry, Tracy. Yeah, I tell you, you need to be prepared. Keep watching those weather forecasts. Well, something else that we could be watching is uh, the lovely Christina from Maastrichter because uh, there are things going on in the city. She's got a great little video for us this week. We've got some very interesting things happening uh, around town. So let's head on over to Christina from Maastrichter for the Out and About News. Lovely. Hello, it's Christina from the Maastrichter. I'm gently rocking in this cool hanging chair in my friend's apartment. Hopefully I don't get seasick. 11th of Feb, 8 o'clock at the Music Hitterei, Pachi Man. He is a Puerto Rican dub artist. So it's that cool, very chilled dub vibe. He actually plays a host of instruments. So all of the samples that he's using, he's recorded himself. And in his performances, he'll bring out some instrument every now and then with like an improvising feel. That should be a nice evening to go to. Very chilled, relaxed vibe. You can have a listen now. The 12th of Feb, Theatre and Head Freitop. It's a vocalist guitar duo, Charlotte Hayson and Philip Breidenbach. I hope I've got that right. <laughs> and they studied together at Maastricht Conservatory. She 
she creates her own compositions and they're quite unusual she's got a beautiful voice but the composition she does some like body percussion and um, some chanson singing in french it's actually a bit like nothing i've ever heard and in the performance they do lots of songs with different languages own compositions but also some classics by Joni mitchell and other artists um, very nice, relaxing, easy to listen to, beautiful concert. The 13th, 11.30 at Theatre Anhed Freitag. There is a Sunday morning concert and it's from some finalists from the Dutch Classical Talent Award. So there's an award run over Holland and the finalists, they get to give all these recitals and then I think at the end of the year, the winner is chosen and they get some money to continue with this, their lessons or developing. So this is a saxophone quartet and um, it's saxophones playing a variety of repertoire that you wouldn't normally hear. So there's some Debussy and Shostakovich in the program. It sounds pretty cool and very different, unusual. Also with the price of the ticket is coffee and fly before the concert. So what better way to start your Sunday? Tuesday the 15th in Herla, the Siconia Consort are uh, giving a concert. They have Lully, Bernstein, Strauss on the programme. So that's quite a big historic gap. And they're giving a concert that's kind of the history of conducting. So I guess different styles of conducting and how the conductor, the role of the conductor developed through these eras. I'm not sure if this is true and I think it was Lully that he used to conduct by hitting the stick on the floor. And I think that he died because once he jammed it in his foot and he got gangrene because <laughs> it was way back in the day. So fun fact for you from my music studies. <laughs> Let's talk about Valentine's Day. Our very own Crown Hotel in the center of Maastricht have a Valentine's promotion. So it's a room obviously for two, for 169 euros, but included in that price is a three course meal with a glass of bubbles and breakfast the next day. So if you'd like to have a treat for yourself or for someone else, remember you can do a friend's Valentine's day and you want to splurge a bit. This is actually incredible value, all that you get in that package. It's also good if you don't have time to leave Maastricht or maybe you don't want to with COVID regulations, you can have a little staycation in the city and it's a lovely hotel, it's overlooking the river. I was lucky enough to have dinner there last week and it was delicious. The staff were fantastic. They were really attentive and the food was really top. So the menu, they've got a lot of gamey stuff on the menu. If you like your wild game, you can go for that. I actually had fish, which is unlike me. <laughs> I had fish and the fish was cooked to perfection and quite big portions. I was definitely full at the end and the dessert was delicious. The starters were delicious. It was a really lovely treat of an experience. So I highly, I can highly recommend that. If you're single on Valentine's Day and you maybe want to try something different. There is a speed dating event at the Student Hotel in Maastricht on the 14th of Feb at 7.30. I'm surprised they still do live speed dating. I tried it years, a million years ago when I was at college and it was very fun and you meet some interesting people but it's also quite exhausting because you just have one or two hours of telling your story over and over again. It's like a never ending job interview with many different people. Um, but that is something fun you could try. And if you're single and completely happy, then do what you want and forget that it's just a normal day. <laughs> that is all. Enjoy your week. Yay, lovely Christmas.
Christina from Maastricht there. Some great tips. Lots of things happening in the city at the moment, Trace. This is good. We've got some music going on there. Not too sure about the speed dating on Valentine's Day. Have you ever been speed dating, Tracy? Um, no, I haven't. I have. It's, um, ah. yes, I've done it a few times, actually. Oh, it's, okay. Um, I wouldn't take it seriously. Uh, right, I think it's, fair uh, enough. Uh, yes, you're just interviewing each other. Although I, I, I often would quite ask somebody who would uh, sit in front of me, have you met your future wife yet? Which uh, always came with a resounding no. <laughs> okay, fair enough, move on. <laughs> but um, usually these things would end up with everybody just standing around at the bar having a few drinks. And I think then actually you got on better and had a proper chat then than you do actually mm. sitting at a desk with a yeah. pen and paper in front of you it's not uh yeah. slightly less intense I suppose mm. yes definitely but uh but no anybody wants to it, it can be fun it can be fun I think uh as I said you don't take it seriously seriously you go in there open-minded and you probably end up making friends more than anything mm. Renee's in the house good evening Renee nice to have you with us any plans for Valentine's Day. What are you going to be uh, getting up to if you have any Valentine's horror stories? I've got some more for you, Tracy. Oh, Here, gosh. I know. How mm. about this? Uh, once in high school, I was asked out on Valentine's Day with a big teddy bear and roses, the whole shebang. However, I had nausea that morning and threw up all over the guy and the gifts. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> That's really bad. Here's another one. We were having dinner at a restaurant and suddenly he jumped up and ran to the bathroom. After about 45 minutes, I got worried and went to check on him. As it turned out, the guy who went into the bathroom before him was his dealer. And they were in there getting oh. high. <gasps> Good Lord. That Not only crazy. was this Valentine's Day, but it was our first date. Oh, dear, oh, dear. I'm assuming this relationship didn't last. I can't imagine it did. Oh, Jesus. Good. That's, that's not a great evening, no. It's not. It's not. No, no. That's, um, the, uh, alarm bells are ringing for sure. For sure. <laughs> but wait, do you want? Let's maybe bring it down. Let's forget about the alarm bells. Let's have a little time to relax, put our feet up, have a little glass of vino, maybe. Oh, because right. it is time for this day this in day history. In history. Hurrah. And today it's the 10th of February 2022. And I'm going to start off with something um, a little bizarre. In, on this day in 1535, 12 nude Baptists ran through the streets of Amsterdam. Oh, okay. I have no idea why. I was going to look it up and I thought, no, do you know what? I'm just going to leave it there. That's what they did. They ran through Amsterdam. What happened before or after, I don't know, but that gives you something to think about. Yeah, it would have been quite chilly, I would expect. At this time of year, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On this day in 1720, Edmund Haley, or Halley, I'm not quite sure how you're supposed to pronounce that actually, was appointed as the second Astronomer Royale at the Greenwich Observatory. And in 1863, on this very day, the first US fire extinguisher was patented and granted to a Lanson Crane of Virginia. Have you ever used a fire extinguisher? Well, actually, happily, I never had to, so no. <laughs> uh, they're very powerful. They're not, mm. they're not easy to use, actually, because they've got quite a bit of oomph, if you know what I mean. Mm. So try to mm. direct it at, uh, if you've got just a, uh, um, uh, a little fire, then okay. But I mean, I've never tried using one of the big ones. I've only used like the little canister type ones, but they're still quite powerful. Mm. But um, yeah. Good, I, yeah. I was going to say good fun, but probably not because you're supposed to be putting out a fire. No, probably not. <laughs> no, probably not. 1870 on this very day, the YWCA, the Young Women's Christian Association, was formed. I don't believe there's been okay. a song about them, Tracy. No, I think it peaked with the YMCA, didn't it? So, uh, yeah. And maybe that's for the best. Probably, yes. 
On this day in 1916, military conscription began in the, the UK. And in 1917, the following year, Johanna Westerdyke uh, was installed as the Netherlands' first female professor. Oh. Mm -hmm. 1931, on the 10th of February, New Delhi becomes the capital of India. And in 1933 was the delivery of the first singing telegram. I don't know what they were singing. I've never had a singing telegram myself. Have you, Tracy? I've never I've seen them on TV and yes. stuff, but never in, never in real life, so to speak. So, yes. uh, yeah. I think whenever I've seen them on TV, it's usually met with a lot of embarrassment, isn't it? Well, I guess that's probably part of the purpose, isn't it, I guess? So, uh, yeah. I quite like the idea of a barbershop quartet coming by and uh, singing something. I, I like that idea, mm. but of course it also depends where you are at the time, I suppose. It does. <laughs> the 10th of February, 1940, uh, Tom and Jerry, the cartoon created by uh, Hannah and Barbera, debuted at MGM. I cannot remember the last time I saw a Tom and Jerry cartoon. Mm -hmm. They used to be on the TV yeah. all the time. They used to be kind of a staple of a Saturday morning, I believe, on, on TV. But, yeah, I guess maybe on Disney Plus you can find them now. Well, probably. Well, that's channels. the thing, isn't it? Because uh, certainly when I was a kid, you didn't have dedicated children's channels like, uh, like you do yeah. now. So uh, they were always yeah. interspersed at certain times of the day when children would probably be watching TV. Mm -hmm. A couple of years later, in 1942, Glenn Miller was awarded the first ever gold record for selling one ah. million copies of... Chattanooga Choo Choo. And in 1959, on this very day, Dutch Princess Wilhelmina publishes Lonely But Not Alone, not a book that I was aware of. 1961, Niagara Falls hydroelectric project begins producing power. And 10 years after that, on this very day, in 1971, the Royal Albert Hall bans the scheduled concert featuring Frank Zappa. Oh, dear. What did he do wrong then? I really, he, he got up to something that he shouldn't have done, that's for sure. <laughs> the following year in 1972, the BBC bands uh, a song by Wings, Give Ireland Back to the Irish. Now, Ooh. they were asking for trouble <laughs> whether it's just a statement or whether you put music to it. That was a little controversial in 1972, that's for sure. Uh I should suspect it's probably would still be controversial today, even to be honest. I think uh, you're right, Trace. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. In 1979, mm. on this very day, do you think I'm sexy? Goes to number one by Rod Stewart. I have to say, this is the period of Rod Stewart's career that I thought was when he went a little bit downhill. If I'm oh honest. dear. <laughs> but he's he's peak. He has peaks and troughs, doesn't he? Rod? He does. So he's, uh, yeah. He does. But it's, yeah. that's the period, isn't it? That whenever you see the uh, Rod Stewart impersonators, they always take that period where he was. But wearing. that was also wasn't he? He also released a song like Maggie and Sailing around that time. Well, which Maggie right, Maggie bad was the early seventies, and that's yeah. absolutely brilliant. Maggie May Sailing, I was I, I didn't like either, to be honest with no. you. That was, that I, was, like that I know it's, it's a big favourite for a lot of people, but um, it was a bit too whimsical for me. But certainly when he was in these uh, skin tight leopard skin trousers and the big spiky hair, that's that's where you, the, the Rod Stewart impersonator is always uh, uh, aimed for, isn't it? <laughs> now, do you remember Miami Vice? Uh, oh, uh, uh, Crockett and Tubbs, isn't that's that it. then? Well, yeah. <laughs> in 1989, on this very day, the 100th episode was uh, seen oh. on TV. Well, I used to be quite a fan of that, I remember. They always had really good music. I, I never watched uh, the show, but I, I believe Phil Collins did one of the theme songs or something yes. uh, in, in one of them. But I, I, I it was Don Johnson, I think, yes, that's uh, right. wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. No, I, 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 I was never really watched, never got into Miami Vice, I must say. Maybe it's something for a rerun one time. Quite possibly. <laughs> I think actually they've done a disastrous movie of it. Oh dear, okay, yes. avoid that then. <laughs> yes, don't do that. Yeah. In 2015, exactly. on this very day, comedian John Stewart announces he will be leaving The Daily Show at the end of the year. Ah, uh, yeah. I used to like John Stewart, I did. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed the, the Daily Show with him. And finally, on this day last year, a 17,000 year old couch shell was discovered to be the oldest known windest instrument after being oh. reassessed by archaeologists. It was found in the Pyrenees. Oh, seventeen thousand okay. years old. So, yeah, one of those um, um, 
Um, yeah, how do you do? Well, if you don't know what a couch shell is, it's just a round one, isn't it? That you blow on and you can get this uh, note come out of it. But uh, yeah, that's uh, known as uh, well. It would be a wind instrument, of course, but uh, seventeen thousand years old. Let's have a look at some birthdays. On this day, 1927, Leontine Price, the American opera soprano, was born. 1939, Roberta Flack, the American pop vocalist, uh, famous for First Time Ever I Saw Your Face and Killing Me Softly. Mm. She was born in North Carolina. 1967, Laura Dern, the American actress, famous for Jurassic Park, born in California. 1955, Greg Norman, the Australian golfer and winner of the British Open, was born in Queensland. And a big shout out to Hayden Connett, who is 15 today, from Mum and Dad. They wish you a very happy birthday. Happy birthday to anybody who's celebrating a birthday today. And that was This Day in History. Indeed. Happy birthday, Hayden, and well done, Joe. Thank you very much. Well, we've still got our wine guru coming up very shortly. He's going to be coming by right to uh, chat about all things wine. But in the meantime, I think it's probably time for a bit of news. What do you think, Trace? Yeah, let's get the news done and then move on to the fun stuff with the wine. <laughs> Tracy Taylor with the news. Yes, thank you, Joe, and good evening, everyone. It's February 10th, and you're watching the Mastered Edition on Facebook Live. First, a look at your weekend weather, and it's going to remain dry on Friday and Saturday with a mix of cloud and sunny spells. Daytime temperatures will reach 8 degrees, but at night will dip to zero or below. Rain and heavy cloud is expected on Sunday, with temperatures hitting 11 during the day, but staying above freezing at night. Moving to your news bulletin for tonight... The World Health Organization has called for enhanced global collaboration to ensure equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines for all countries. It said high-income countries should provide financial support to help global efforts against the pandemic. Director General of the WHO has said that, depending on where you live, it may feel like the pandemic is almost over or is at its worst. But wherever you live, COVID isn't finished with us. A group of anti-vaxxers invaded a GGD location in Harlem today. During the incident, there was a heated discussion with various employees and there was also a scuffle. The activists have shared images of the incident on Twitter. The housing shortage in the Netherlands will likely increase for at least three years. The number of households is growing while too few building permits have been granted. According to experts, the Netherlands will be short of 316,000 homes in 2024. The first Stemwiser voting tools came online today, some five weeks before the local elections of March 16th. Five local authorities, including Maastricht and Eindhoven, have also requested an English version. Thousands of foreign residents will be able to take part in the elections because voting is open to all EU nationals and anyone who has lived in the Netherlands for more than five years, as long as they are officially registered with their local authority. Japan is offering Europe part of its liquefied natural gas imports over fears that supplies will be disrupted by tensions surrounding a possible Russian invasion of Ukraine. Multiple gas shipments are already being diverted to Europe by private Japanese firms. Fears are mounting that the conflict in Ukraine could cause an energy crisis in Europe, which depends heavily on Russian gas. Astronomers have detected a new planet around the star closest to the sun. Using the European Southern Observatory's Very Large Telescope in Chile, they found evidence of the body orbiting Proxima Centauri. The candidate planet is the third detected in the system and is just a quarter of the size of Earth, making it the lightest yet. The planet is over four light years away from the sun. And finally tonight, if everything goes according to plan, it looks like Limburg Supply will be earning the Protected Geographical Indication Stamp, which is an official recognition of being a regional product. Limburg Supply has become a symbol of Dutch and Belgian uh, Limburg. When assessing what may be called Limburg Supply, it mainly comes down to the making and baking of same. Whether the protected status will come about or not remains to be seen, but we can still enjoy the fly either way. And that's it for tonight. For local news, you can follow RTV News in English on Facebook and Instagram. If you're a local business, be sure to check out the Support Your Local Business South Limburg Facebook page, a joint initiative between Hashtag Maastricht and the Maastricht Edition. 
And if you want to discover events, concerts, and cultural activities going on in Maastricht and the surrounding areas, head on over to the website of our partner, Maastrichter.com. If a historical walking tour is more your thing, check out Meet Maastricht, the key to your city. And finally, don't forget that you can always find us on the Maastricht Edition Facebook page, on YouTube, on Redbubble, and on Instagram. For all the details, check out the maastrichtedition.nl. Nicely done, now, Tracy. Thank you so much. That's exciting news about the Blythe. I know, yes. I think this is something that's been uh, discussed before, in fact, uh, with a lot of bakers feeling that it should be, uh, you know, protected and really something that comes from the region, like, you know, Gouda cheese comes from Gouda and Parma ham mm-hmm. comes from, and champagne comes from a certain part of France and all these kinds of things. Um, but yeah, I guess it's still got to be discussed. It's whatever places it needs to be discussed. And we'll hear more. Yeah, excellent. Well, I know uh, the Dutch take it very seriously when, when it comes to, to fly. And uh, somebody we could actually ask about that is our lovely Robert de Koning from we- Wine Winkle Week. Good evening. Hello, good evening. How are you doing? Very well. How are you? I'm excellent. Thank you. Got excellent. Actually, before, before we talk about uh, uh, wine, the reason you're here, where do you stand on uh, Limburg's of Fly? Are you a big fan? Oh, I'm, I love it. I mean, we we live in our Benestraat, you know, that's where up on the, uh, the end of the street, that's where the best fly from the whole of Maastricht are coming. Yeah. I'm not going to do any advertising, but you need to go to Hermans. It's the most beautiful, the best fly in the whole of Maastricht, of Limburg. I'm not going to make any, you know, public advertising here, but they're really, really good. They're really okay. good. Okay, so... Uh, so- uh, we go up and take our Limburg to fly. You know. It has come to my attention in uh, the uh, several years that I have been living here that everybody, any Dutch person in this area will say to you, oh, yes, uh, I know where you can get the best fly. Um, mm. In fact, uh, I have met several people who said, oh, my grandfather invented fly. <laughs> and of course, they can't all be right. <laughs> Yeah, that is true. That is true. No, it's true. My the grandfather of my wife used to be a baker, so you know. Ah, okay. So my father-in-law used to bake fly, but that's way before my time because I've never seen him doing it. So um, yes. <laughs> Do you have a favorite fly? I like um, rice to fly. I yeah. like croissant uh, yeah. uh, with uh, schuim, with foam. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, uh, gooseberries. Mm-hmm. And then you got a really nice thick foam on top of it. That's really nice. Yeah, it's it's you know it keeps you in shape, whatever shape. A shape, <laughs> definitely. I have to say that the, the gooseberry one I do like very much because I don't have gooseberries very often. And I, I certainly the first time I had a, a gooseberry fly here, I thought, Christ, I can't remember the last time I had gooseberries. So I, I like that very much. What about you, mm. Tracy? Well, I really hate the gooseberry one, so that's ugh, awful. My favorite has to be Kersenfly mit Kraumelin. I think that's nice. my favorite one. So, yeah. uh, and preferably warm, slightly warm, then it's yes. uh, extra nice. Mm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I like strawberries as well, though. Mm-hmm. Okay, this could go on for yeah. days, couldn't it? And I'm yeah. getting hungrier by the minute the more that we talk about it. So let's let's talk about the real reason you're here. Of course, we're going to be talking about mine. Um, we are coming up to Valentine's Day. It's in a few days' time, of course. What do we drink for Valentine's? Bubbles. Of course. Of course. Of course, <laughs> bubbles. And, you know, it's once a year, it's Valentine's. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, would you buy a really cheap sausage roll for Christmas? Nah. No. You want to go for the real thing. You want to drink a really nice glass of bubble champagne. Mm-hmm. If you really love your partner, bring a bottle of champagne. See, <laughs> this is the thing, isn't it? You end up judging how much your partner loves you by how much they've spent on the champagne. <laughs> you know, don't be bothered about a card. You know, just give a good bottle of champagne. <laughs> that does the trick. Okay. Well. <laughs> so, what recommendations do you have for us then on the, on the champagne front? Well, it's 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 champagne. We got our own little our house, uh, Pascal Lejeune. Uh, which is a which is a really nice champagne. 
quite affordable. Starts at uh, 2850 and it goes up to 3550s for the really more expensive ones. So it's really affordable. It's a very small maker. It makes 18,000 bottles. It's really nice. Not too high in acidity. It's not sweet. It is dry. It's a really nice champagne. And we got like six, di six different uh, kinds of it. So it's all oh, varieties. Awesome. And they're all really good. And, you know, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to cost 50 or 60 or 70 euros. You know, for around 30 years, you got a really nice champagne. But I can understand, you know, 30 euros, you know, with all the inflation going on, it's still a lot of money. So you can also take a really nice Prosecco or Cava at around 10 euros. It's, it's the thought that counts. Now, are there rules about when you're supposed to be drinking your champagne? Because um, quite often you would have that maybe as an aperitif at the, at the beginning of your meal. But, you know, you sit there, you've, you've only drunk half the bottle. There's still half a bottle left. Am I able to drink this during the meal or is that a no-no? Oh, you can drink it during a meal, you know make some lobster or something like that, you know, uh, other seafoods is allowed as well, which is uh, uh, crab or, uh, you know, the lighter dishes, fish you can do it with, it's no problem. Don't go for heavy meats. You know, when I, mm -hmm. I went to the hotel mm -hmm. school here in Maastricht and every year we went, uh, well, no, once we went on a wine journey. It took eight days and we started off at Moet Chandon and we actually got two glasses for an aperitif and they got six courses. And for every course, they had a different champagne. You can imagine two glasses plus six. It was a great evening, a lot of singing. But we also, uh, yes, I still remember the last glass. But can you? Anyway, yeah, I can say now. No, but seriously, you can drink for every, there's for every meal, for every dish, there's a, a different kind of champagne. But if you take the champagne, which is lighter for an aperitif, Go for fish, go for even a light chicken dish you can do, but don't go for the meats, that will be too heavy. But the best thing is to be with champagne is is lobster. Yeah, It's what New Year's Eve you do, uh, in England you do uh, scrambled eggs, or salmon and champagne. Why? Because scrambled eggs is a dry dish and goes really well with champagne as well. So there's a, there are a lot of different combinations uh, possible with champagne. I have to say, I don't know about you, Tracy, but I've never thought about having a different glass of champagne with uh, each course. No, but it's probably like Robert said, generally, if you're having champagne or bubbles, you might not have it every day of the week. So when you splurge, you you buy one nice, good bottle. So, yes. you know, you're going to enjoy that as your aperitif. Um, so that's probably why you're not at home enjoying a different glass with every course, I expect. because oh, it's of something. Not. A special occasion but no i've had uh, mostly uh, champagne for an aperitif at the beginning or very really at the beginning of the meal that's that's about yeah, as far right. as it's gone here yeah. and um, for breakfast yeah. as well oh absolutely. oh yes brunch brunch is good bubbles and brunch is always a bubbles, nice brunch, bubbles. you know it, it gets the whole system working i say you know, mm. good, <laughs> good morning perfect uh, don't drink the whole bottle you know you throw your day away but you know a glass is great well yeah. you know well, it depends you know, how you, you want your day to pan out, really. For aperitif and drink it throughout your meal. And now you say, well, you know, one glass for breakfast. Is it going to be enough? I'm not sure. Well, it's Valentine's Day, you know. Okay, it's a Monday, but there's nothing wrong with celebrating Valentine's Day on, you know, on the weekend. Absolutely. Yeah, make a special day out of it. So you have a really nice lay in on Sunday. You know, it's that you can do as well. I think yep. there's a lot of restaurants offering Valentine's menus throughout the whole weekend because, yeah. you know, you can really relax and in the morning you can sleep in, have a nice glass of champagne. Yeah. 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 Well, that's it's, it's really... So yeah. I was going to say that's Valentine's Day um, sorted. But as we said at the, the top of the show, the weather is changing now. We are uh, moving into spring and tastes are changing. So. Thank God. Yeah, thank goodness. I noticed uh, some uh, spring flowers coming up in the garden and it's getting lighter in the evening. So we're going to maybe start moving away from the, the heavy reds of winter, do you think now? I hope so. I think so, yes. It's going, it, as soon as the sun comes out, you will always almost enjoy, you know, you, you, the scents in the air and you're going to think, oh, wow, it's spring. I always have it for spring. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a winter person. So when I smell the, 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 the new scents and everything else coming, the new life coming on, 
you know, you want to have a really nice glass of wine with that. I'm, I'm going then back to a bit more the white wines. And I think, oh, lovely, you know, it's great. A nice aromatic white wine will do really well with, uh, you have a good Stramina, you could have a Malvasia, which has a bit of roses in it in the sense. So, you you know, marrying up the, the sense you have in the air with your wine, which is beautiful. So it's it's going to be a really nice season again with nice, elegant wines and elegant dishes. And I think that's going to be great. Yeah. So what's, uh, what's new in the shop? Oh, what's, oh, a lot of new in the shop. Uh, we got a lot of new, of course, a lot of new orange wine. We got some really nice new white wines, Portuguese, which are really nice. Uh, let me see. Uh, we got a lot of the, the old wines, the, the Italian wines we had before. We have them back again. Nice Nebbiolos, which are really elegant, so very good for springtime. You know, a bit of lamb, stuff like that. So yeah, it's 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 going back to to slightly lighter wines, a lot of Pinot Noirs, of course, but not the, the really. Of course, there are people really fan of heavy wines. We we'll always keep them. Don't worry, you know. Okay. But it's uh, it's also a bit of space for some 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 more elegant wines again mm. to marry up with the dishes. Yeah. Now, what about your rosés? Because um, I've, I've noticed over uh, the years that uh, we've popped in to, to get our wine from you that um, your rosés uh, change quite often uh, each year. Um, is that because you um, are only looking at um, the really good ones for that particular year? Or is it you like to move around from country to country? Well, why would that be? It's also, well, we, we started off with, with one kind of rosé, and now it got too expensive. Uh, you know, there's, only, there's only so much money we Dutch mm-hmm. are willing to spend. If you go to France, you go to the supermarket, you got rosés for 11, 12 euros, no mm-hmm. problem with that. For us, it needs to be around the 10 euro mark. It can't yeah, be 14 years, people won't pay that. So we also have to look for, okay, what is really for? But also we got, we got the Pink Show, which is a... Really nice, Côte Provence um, for around 10 euros. We had that for a few years now. And we have often, now and then we got uh, uh, the Malgar, which is a, it is a really nice rosé as well. Uh, but it's, it's slightly less expensive. So mm-hmm. you have to be, it's, it's, a, it's a price sensitive wine. Right. People think, oh, you know, but, you know, imagine rosé with a really nice bit of salmon or with, with, with crab or some other, it's beautiful. And people tend to forget road to see rosé as a proper wine. Well, I don't know about you, Tracy, but I've I've often found years ago it was difficult to get a good rosé. I think mm. they seem to have improved over the years. I don't know. I well, generally don't don't drink rosé, so I can't help you out in that one, Joe. <laughs> so it's, think about having a really nice. Um, um, like like prawns or scampis on a barbecue with a bit of chili and garlic and then have a really nice rosé with it. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's nice. But they, they do tend to get lighter and lighter and lighter in colour every year. We don't like the really yeah. heavy rosés anymore, which we still have a bit in Spain, which are really dark. No, we want to have it... It, it needs to be made of a of a red grape, but we want to have it as as soft as possible. Yes, yes, I, I, I like the lighter ones, especially in the summer. For me, though, that's definitely a patio wine. Absolutely, but then again, you know, if you do your barbecue and do some put some prawns on it or some scampi on it, and then dry it with your rosé, you're going to really enjoy <sighs> barbecue. Barbecue, just. <laughs> Oh, I'm just thinking being outside in the garden, lovely summer's day, and friends round. Oh, can't wait. Can't wait. You have to wait for a bit, though, I think. I mean, yeah, it's not going to be happening. No, but it's coming. It's coming. Robert, as but always, it's absolutely it's lovely nice. to see you. Well, absolutely. Nice to be there again. Yeah. Uh, remind everybody uh, where you are. We are in the Rechtsstraat, Wijnwinkelwijk, and you can come to us for all your lovely wines. And we will be doing in April again a open bottle day. Ah. So we open about a hundred different wines, and everybody can well on invitation, of course. Uh, people who come to our store say, "Oh yes, we would like to join." Then we we invite them, and we have uh, a really nice crowd, and we're enjoying a lot of different wines. And uh, so that's that's for us. We're looking really forward to spring again. 
Excellent. Seeing all our friends, all our customers, and uh, yeah, it's going to be good fun. Uh, well, they, they are good fun, and uh, I would recommend them to, to anybody. Robert, as always, absolute star. Thank you very much for imparting all your knowledge. We shall see you again. Love to the family. Thanks ever so much. Thank you. Happy Valentine. Happy Valentine's Day. Bye. <laughs> Oh, bless him. And those uh, open bottle days, oh, what fun they are. Oh, I, I, I never had the pleasure, so I, I'll take your word on that one. Oh, it's a lot of wine, Tracy. Yeah. Oh, right. You, oh. you, you have to uh, go into training for a couple of weeks beforehand, oh. sort of build yourself up to it, as it were. <laughs> that kind of a day, is it? Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> right, but he does have such fantastic wine there, and of course they're um, uh, they're all bio wines, very reasonably priced, definitely worth popping into, and uh, certainly if you want to get uh, something a little special for this weekend, it's a good place to stop. Mm. Okay, well, we're coming towards the end of the show, but before we go, I think we probably should uh, nip over to the lovely Lucy at Meese Maastricht and see what she's talking about this week. Absolutely, let's check it out. Hello there. For your five minutes history and heritage of Maastricht, today I would like to talk about Stag. Stag is the Maastricht word for star, and you will find a white five pointed star in the flag of the city, incorporated also into the carnival flag of the city and in the emblem of the angel uh, holding the uh, shield, uh, displaying the star as well. The star I am going to talk about for a few minutes now is the Maastrichter star, and that is a choir. A, a, a pretty huge all-male choir. It dates back to the last years of the 19th century, when in, in circles of the well-to-do citizenry, uh, people were taking up all sorts of, you know, fun and games to entertain themselves, much like we do, uh, sometimes in, in, in similar manifestations, sometimes in vastly different ones. Maastricht still has lots of choirs, and especially the two of the great basilicas are Excellent, but that is not what the Maastricht of Star started out as being. That was not the intention at all. People just wanted to have a good time, basically, and the singing was very much secondary. Um, but among the organizations of that time, what, what set the Star apart was the fact that it was open to everybody, all, uh, all strata of society. So uh, it wasn't just the well-to-do citizens, but it was also uh, craftspeople, shopkeepers, uh, 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 skilled laborers from the, from the extensive uh, 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 industries in the city participating. And, and that, that has remained the case down through the, down through the decades. Another thing that has remained uh, fixed was that the, um, the makeup of the choir was extremely mixed. It might be it might be called the the Maastrichter star, but the people singing there and and still singing there are both uh, uh, native uh, Maastrichtenaire, so people who are who are uh, uh, local for generations back, uh, the so-called Hollanders, with which the locals mean basically everybody from you know outside the city up north. They're not necessarily from Holland, but you know that's just a catch-all phrase that's being used. Um, they would be Protestant, they would be Catholic, uh, they would be uh, from different parts of the city. So it was a it was a very much uh, a unified force, which of course is nice too when there is all sorts of sectionalism going on at the same time as well. Um, as I said, they started out uh, as a very, uh, you know, happy-go-lucky, we are just singing for the hell of it sort of choir. But around the, uh, the change of the century, they uh, acquired a, a conductor who meant business, 
and who whipped them into shape, uh, which meant winning prizes in singing contests and foreign tours and stuff like that. And with some ups and downs, they have managed to hold on to that tradition, still being an amateur choir, and even building a concert hall for themselves. That was also called the Stag. And Maastricht enjoyed all sorts of, of, of displays and festivities and theater pieces and fun and games there until it was demolished. It used to stand at the Hendrik van Veldeke Square, the tiny square uh, adjacent to Sofas and St. John's Church. After the Second World War, the choir very much professionalized in the sense that uh, uh, music, education, uh, composers being hired, uh, uh, recordings made, appearances on Dutch television and all that uh, became run-of-the-mill for the staff. They still exist. Um, they're having a problem with aging out. They're always looking for good male voices. If you like to sing, find them. Oh, thank you, Lucy. The lovely Lucy there from Meet Maastricht. Talking mm -hmm. about the Star Choir. I have to confess, mm -hmm. this was a new one to me. I did not know about this choir. Have you seen it, Tracy? Yeah, no, no I, I haven't. Uh, no. So, so uh, can I have to make an effort to go and see these guys? It's absolutely huge and uh, has an awful lot of history there. So, uh, yes, going to go and uh, make an effort to, to check them out. Do you like yes. a, a, a good choir? And, of course, uh, the lovely Matt that uh, uh, used to be part of the show comes from uh, Wales, and Wales is uh, known for their uh, male voice choirs. So there's something about the... Uh, I'm going off at a tangent here, obviously, but something about the, the Welsh voices, they seem to just go on and on and on. I saw a documentary recently about uh, Shirley Bassey. She's in her 80s, still singing magnificently. Tom mm. Jones from Wales as well, fantastic voice. He's in his 80s. It's, uh, it's quite astonishing. But there's something about being part of a choir, though, definitely. There's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's nice just being around people all singing together. You can get that anywhere, of course, but in a choir, I don't know, it gives, it's a, oh, it's a nice tingly moment. I like it. Mm. Have, okay. Haven't done it for a while, but it's, yeah, it's lovely. Anyway, we've come to the end of the show, Tracy. So, yeah. um, Valentine's, as we said, is coming up in a few days. We hope you have a lovely day if you're celebrating it. If you're not, have a lovely day anyway, whatever it is that you're up to. Um, the weather's going to maybe dip and get a little bit colder um, coming up, so make sure you wrap up warm. Stay safe, and we shall see you again uh, next week. Thank you ever so much, and we'll see you next uh, Thursday. Take care now. Bye. Bye. Oh, and Renee says, thanks, ladies. 